Soviet moon, but uh, spacecraft uh, will not only feel the gravity of the Earth and the Sun, but it will also you know, be subject to the rotation of that system because the gravity of the Earth keeps going around the Sun. And as a consequence, um, there's three points where you have the saddle point, semi-stability. You can sit there, but you need to use a little propellant to stay there, like L2. And L2, by the way, is the best because L2 is here, the Earth is here, the Sun is there. So you're always on the dark side of both sides if you have the Sun shield in between. But L4 and L5 are stable, meaning once you fall in there, you can't get out, which is a good thing if you're an asteroid, but a bad thing if you're a spacecraft because you're sitting there with the asteroids. You don't want that to happen. Yeah? Good, okay. good question. Other questions? How are we doing time wise? Uh, we, I think we could take this opportunity actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he wanted to see. Oh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Let's right. see that. That is a uh, Yeah, yeah. Let's see where it is. We need to get it all dark here. I don't remember how to do this. Um, I think it's this one. Take a minute. Uh huh. Yeah, actually, it's this uh huh. Uh, let me get rid of this one. Uh, so, away, away for that. Did something here and I made this full screen below. Um, so, this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field as you have seen it. It's only the optical data, it doesn't contain the infrared data. But oh, forgot to say, I brought uh, not only my lunch here, which I didn't eat, it was the accretion disk with a supermassive black hole. I also brought my coffee. Um, I don't need the coffee, but I do need the straw. So this is not a real straw, it is a stir straw, I guess a little tiny hole, right? If I looked at a tiny hole in the straw, that's about how, how wide, how narrow the Hubble Ultra Deep Field is in the sky. Right? So that's a very tiny field. And inside this tiny field, which is 10 times smaller than the full moon diameter, there is between 10 and 27,000 galaxies, depending how you count. So this data set is truly three-dimensional, you can click on one, and jump to it, and there it is, and you can use the mouse, it's a bit slow, you can use the mouse button to zoom in and out. Uh, let me go back to the start here. Um, so if I, first of all, I can wobble the data, and you see the foreground galaxies, you know, they, they, they are in the foreground, and then I can go uh, with my mouse to a somewhat further distance, and the redshift, by the way, is indicated there, so this is a redshift point 0.15, which is roughly 15% back in time. Um, not quite like that. And now here we're at a redshift of 0.4, and so we're getting closer and closer into the furthest galaxies. We call this software the AHA, which stands for Appreciating Hubble at Hyperspeed, because when you run to a galaxy like this, you momentarily, it should tell you that actually. Where did it go? I think it froze. You're momentarily running at it says 10 to the 12 times the speed of light. Don't do this at home. Uh, it's forbidden by laws of physics, but it would otherwise take 13.7 billion years to make this journey. Here we do it in a few minutes. So there's a galaxy, and you can sort of, boy, that is slow, it's surprising. You can sort of wobble them around and see where they are in relation to each other, and then zoom in and out. And then. So I'm trying to go all the way to the edge of the universe, so to speak, now I'm a redshift almost two, where the galaxies get initially bluer despite the redshift. The redshift makes the universe expand, right? And it's a really a cosmological constant or something that makes it expand. But it expands with time, and therefore, the further back you look in time, the redder an object look, looks because it just, you know, the light was uh, stretched <coughs> by that far from the blue ultraviolet to the infrared. Yet the galaxies look blue because they're intrinsically so blue. That's because they're all dominated by the, these cosmic fraternity members. And then when you go far enough back in time, like here was one, where did it go? Uh, click on one, see if my, my cursor can catch it. Um, there we go. Um, here's one at a redshift 3.8. So that's, you know, now more than 10 mil billion years in back in time. And that's what it looks like. And then um, I'm exceeding the speed of, not the speed limit, I'm exceeding the speed of light several times. Um, and if I keep going in that direction, eventually I get to the edge of the visible universe. I'm trying to find my last red dot here, nor I went. I sort of have to pan around a bit. But you get the gist, and um, um, Professor Williger here will have the, uh, the software, which is online. It's a Java tool. that You need a fairly fast computer to, to enjoy it. But, uh, so you know, this tool exists, and you can 
go into it and load the images as you see fit. Yeah? All right, thank you very much. So we've got the warp drive invented already, at least uh, for visualization. Well, at this point, I would like to thank you all for coming. We will have a reception afterwards, which uh, Mr. Lowry Watkins Jr. has generously uh, provided for us. I also would like to ask you to, there's a sign-up sheet for your email address so that we can keep in touch with you for future bullet lectures and public uh, lectures in astronomy. And also there's a flyer, we have a Facebook page which is for the Bullet Lecture, friends of the Bullet Lecture and of uh, Louisville Astronomy. I invite you to take a flyer and get onto the Facebook site because we would like to keep in touch with you and we appreciate the support that you give to astronomy here and uh, we enjoy presenting the universe to you. So we'll see you outside.